بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلات و السلام على سیدنا و نبینا و طبیب نفوسنا و حبیب قلوبنا ابل قاسم محمد صلی الله علیه و آله و سلم لا سیما بقیت الله روحی و ارواح العالمین لمقدمه الفداء الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله Respected brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Inshallah from tonight we start the series of talks about uh, as the heading I suggested our logbook in Barzakh so inshallah we'll be going through uh, step by step uh, in our life in Barzakh tonight is allow me to make it more of an introduction and an orientation to tell you what the whole story is about and why is it that it's important to study about our life after death first of all when you want to conduct the research you need to find your right uh, and uh, authentic sources what would be the best source if I want to study about life after death? Science has almost nothing. When I say almost, I want to be safe. Otherwise, I would say absolutely nothing. Human science of 21st century is almost no different than 2,000 years ago when it comes to life after death. When we want to do a research, I was saying that science has almost nothing to talk about this issue and doesn't provide us any sort of information. The best that one may arguably say is what they call it the near-death experience that is also a lot of question about validity of it or, or not, if you are familiar with this concept of near-death experience. What about philosophers and thinkers? Non-Muslims, of course, no need to talk about that. They are also blind about life after death. Muslim philosophers, even the most genius one, almost 1,000 years ago, Abu Ali Sina, known in the West as Avesina, very correctly, he says, when it comes to life after death, we have to surrender that our intellect cannot reach out there. And we have to submit to whatever that the Quran and uh, the revelation basically is telling us. That's why the best authentic source of information for life after this is the revelation, scripture, divine scriptures. Now, speaking of the divine scriptures available supposedly partially to us is the Old Testament, New Testament, Final Testament. New, o, no Old Testament and New Testament together makes the Bible, okay? The Bible, both Old and New Testament, almost has nothing about life after this. The information about life after this is so basic, so basic. So much so, frankly speaking, I've been in uh, so many interfaith seminars. I remember once a very famous rabbi uh, in Australia was invited to represent the Jewish community. And when it was his turn to speak about the spirituality and issues related to life after death, he said, I really don't know why I'm invited here. Because in Judaism, there is no much, if at all, emphasis on life after death. And that's what the Quran also says. I heard this, from, this horse's mouth I'm quoting, huh? directly from what the rabbi was saying, that in Judaism, there is almost no emphasis about life after death, if anything at all. Christianity, especially Catholicism, yes, there, are, there is belief about life after death and hell and, and heaven as well. But the details, I say this so that you admire the scripture that we have uh, in our hand. The details of the information available to humanity in the form of revelation that reveals nothing but the truth, you will never find it in any scripture, any book, in today's world or in the past, in other than the Holy Quran. The, whole, uh, the Holy Quran consists of over 6,000 ayat. You are familiar, inshallah, with this information. Of over 6,000 ayat, as counted by scholars, 1,920 ayat are related to monotheism, unity of God, and divine names and attributes. 
So in a nutshell, almost 2,000, which makes almost 30% of the Qur'an, is only about Tawheed, unity of God. The second most important topic that is mentioned in the Qur'an with bulk of information that you will not find anywhere else is when it comes to life after death. 1,620 ayat of the Qur'an which makes more than 25% of the Qur'an speaks about life after death. Such a mystery that the science of 21st century has not discovered. Such a mystery that the old scripture available today, like the Old and New Testaments, have almost no information about it. How blessed we are to, be, uh, to have access to this book. Because I'm sure any sensible person, with all respect, I'm sure you all have had this concern. And the older you get, the more you see people around you are dying, naturally the more conscious you become about life after this. The more curious you will be that really what is going to happen. I wish I could see my dad, my mother, my grandpa in Barzakh, how they live their life. How, how is the life after this? What is this all about, the experience of this? Have you ever been curious about it? Subhanallah, inshallah, if I get an opportunity to talk, so much of your, your questions are clearly answered. By who? By the Prophet who does not speak but the truth. By the one who has gone there, experienced, seen, and came back and narrated the story to us as it was, not based on dreams or contemplation and, and things like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, so if, there, if you want to put them together, unity of God and life after death together make almost half of the discussions of the Qur'an. It is for this reason that to speak uh, or pick up any topic after Tawheed, confidently I tell you there is no subject in Islam more important talking about death and beyond, life after death, following the instructions of the Qur'an. Let me add something that on, uh, in our day sandwich program I had touched on that in case some of the brothers, of course many of you are not there, allow me to repeat it here. Teachers, parents, those in charge of educational uh, system of the school, if you want to lay a foundation for your children, start with fundamentals of religion. Start with teaching them, making them faithful, not learned kids not kids that they know who was the mother of Moses I don't know uh, how many times because sometimes they arrange schools they arrange competitions and they come to me Sheikh what is the answer of this I look I say well I even don't know the answer what kind of knowledge does it bring you what kind of faith it gives you that certain word how many times is repeated in the Quran it doesn't really help the term the name of her own how many times mentioned the Quran so what What's got to do with the price of the fish as we say in New Zealand? What kind of business, what kind of uh, yani knowledge is this? What we need to do for our children first, the primary school level should be focusing only on usul al-deen, aqayyad, faith especially, not just learning and knowledge for the sake of knowledge. What, and when you look at the curve of the trend of teachings of Islam, the, the, the Sower chapters or the ayat of the Qur'an revealed to the Prophet from during the time that the Prophet was residing in Mecca, the first 13 years, almost all of them are talking about Tawheed and Ma'ad and life after this. And as goes towards the end of the life of the Prophet in Medina and towards the end of his life in Medina, you see that the curve of the ayat related to life after death is coming down less, less, less until almost nothing. Why? Because the foundation was made in Medina. Believe Muslims were believers. If a girl is not wearing the, her hijab properly, if a girl or young boy or girl, they are like a slack about their salat and not serious about it, rest assured, just talking about hijab is not going to help. You have to tell them, give them that faith, which is the engine of the hijab. Faith is the engine of their salat, psalm, and everything else. If that faith is there, wherever in the world your children will be, they will be safe. 
if that face is lacking just keep talking to them or ordering them that in fear of that I have to say two rakat namaz sob in fear of that or I'm wearing the hijab in fear of mom that that's how it is the moment they are away they become a different person and to increase the faith nothing is so important and so influential as speaking about death and beyond I prove it to you from the Quran inshallah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran wants to prove the existence of God to the disbelievers look at the logic and analogy used in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to prove to disbelievers that God exists God proves his existence through taking him to life after death. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Kayfa takfuruna billah wa kuntum amwatan. How can you, this is a rhetorical question, how can you disbelieve in God and once upon a time you were dead? Dead means the sense of you, were no, you had no life. Like when you were in the fetus of your mother or before that a semen, like there was no uh, living creature. وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْ كَيْفَ تَكْفَرُونَ بِاللَّهُ وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْ وَتَنْ فَأَحْيَاكُمْ Then God gave you life. This black box of life that science has no idea what it is. وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْ فَأَحْيَاكُمْ ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ Then your God again is going to cause you to die one day in your life. ثُمَّ يُحْيِيكُمْ On the day of judgment, God will resurrect you. ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ And then you will be going back to Allah so the point is that God wants to prove remember the ayah began with this kayfatak faruna billah how can you deny the existence of God and then when God wants to prove his existence take you to life after this a hint I give you if you have ever discussion any, any ch uh, chance to talk with the disbelievers to atheists instead of talking to them about God and prove the existence of God talk to them about this and after this this is the style of the Quran and that's why if anyone asks me Shaykh I have a copy I want to give a book to a non-believer to a non-Muslim which what's the best book I tell him there is no book better than the Quran but tell them read this you know some Bible studies they they tell you in the beginning of the, the book they write we recommend that you read these chapters this part of the Bible first in the Quran also for the beginners non-believers you tell them start reading this book from end to the beginning not from beginning to the end because the beginning of the Quran like Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa is much of jurisprudence in it it's unnecessary for them in the end of the Quran is and the emphasis is on Tawheed and life after death and that's what they need they need to start from where they are going to finish their life from this so for us also for our children also it's so important to start studying about Islam if we want to make lay the foundation start thinking reflecting about what happens to me after this uh, uh, inshallah sallu ala muhammad wa ala muhammad Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran again is telling us Belief in death and beyond is so central that any other Islamic principle stem from it. I'll give you some examples. Self-purification is definitely a very important virtue in Islam. To be able to have self-restraint. Fasting is for the sake of self-restraint. Okay? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Quran says, do you want to succeed in that jihad al-akbar, the greatest jihad? If you want to succeed, be conscious of your death. Always, brothers and sisters, we need to repeat these until it becomes our second nature. As you are sitting here, you are living in Barzakh. As you will be at work tomorrow, you are living in Barzakh. Every single day, imagine the years of your life like different diaries. Every page of that diary, one day of your life, every page of the diary of your life will come back to you in the hereafter take this example a Bedouin illiterate person came to the masjid of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ala Muhammad he said Ya Rasulallah I'm living in a remote area far away and I'm not literate 
Is it really necessary that every day we have to come to the masjid and learn? I don't have time and it's not possible for me. Give me some Islam in a zip version that helps me for the rest of my life. I cannot come to Medina every day. The Prophet appointed one of the companions and said, teach him note. Out of all the ayat and surah in the Quran, the Prophet said, teach him surah Zalzal. Ida zulzilat al ardu zilzalaha. And the narrator says that when the companion reached the end of it, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَهُ Any atom weight of good or evil, you will see it in the hereafter. You only think of this. Any good, you will see. Any evil, you will see in the hereafter. The man, the Bedouin simple man came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, we see it? We really see it? The sin that I committed secretly, I will see it. And the Prophet says, yes, not only you see it, there are witnesses that are going to see it. That secret no longer will be a secret, will be publicized unless you bent it with the Tawbah in dunya. The man fainted and said, it's enough for me. I don't need to learn anymore. I got the point. I got the message. The narrator says, the Prophet says to the companion, in Sarafar Rajulu Faqihan, this man came back, went back home as a Faqih. Like he became a Mujtahid. Truly believing in life after death can make you a Mujtahid in the real sense of it, without being an Ayatollah. Mujtahid, Faqih, yani the one who has a good deep knowledge about his religion or her religion. That's why Quran says that for those who want to succeed in self-building, you need to always be conscious of your life after this. Anything you do, anything you say, anything you want to watch, always think of this. Is this going to help me after my death or going to harm me? And then you, you decide and act accordingly. Amma, um, what's the ayah? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. بل يريد الإنسان ليفجر أمامه يسأل أيان يوم القيامة قرآن says do you know why is it that those sinful people so called atheists they deny God's existence they deny life after death because they want to unleash their whim and desire their evil desire and I have met some of them, you might have met as well, someone that had a very good conversation with him, Alhamdulillah, about Islam, and he turned and said that Mansur, Islam is a very good religion. You make a lot of senses to me. If one day I decide to become a, a theist, believer in God, Islam is, a, is my choice. But you know, I'm over 60 and I cannot have dinner unless, with all respect, red wine is on my table, non-Muslim. And you're telling me that as a Muslim, I cannot drink alcohol. I'm not ready. That's the eye of the Quran. Because they want to sin. And Islam wants to put the bridle to control, self-restraint. Because they don't want self-restraint, they say, Who says there is day of judgment? They deny it so that they justify what they are doing. So if anyone wants to succeed in self-building and self-restraint, remembering of death and life after death is essential. For worshipping acts, again Quran says that in the beginning, second page of the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ You say the rest. وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ They are correlated to each other. Unless you and I had faith in the unseen, life after death is unseen. Unless you have faith in that, why did we have to fast the whole day? What is the difference between Salat and Layl? Let me give you a simpler example. What's the difference? Last year I mentioned this. Let us not forget what we have discussed. Nafile namaz sob tu rak'at. And the second surah is not necessary. So you can just say hamd. Subhanallah, Ruku. Literally, it takes less than one minute. Nafile namaz sob. Question: How many of us we do nafile namaz sob, which takes less than one minute? Last year here, this member testifies that I quoted Imam Khomeini from his Rasale, and I deliberately quoted the Rasale of Imam Khomeini to, so that nobody says, Sheikh, this hadith is not authentic. Had it not been authentic, our maraja would not give fatwa to it. 
امام خمینی سیز نافله نماز صبح the most high prayer before fajr prayer is more rewarding than namaz shab allahu akbar more rewarding than namaz shab and i told you the reason for that now why is it that we are not very serious about it but when it comes to namaz sob inshallah we make sure we don't miss our namaz sob i'm talking about us good people inshallah you know why the difference is because when it comes to namaz sob i know that if i don't do my namaz sob there will be a hell punishment ma salakakum fi saqar what made you end up in hell those uh, uh, like guards of the hell they are asking people who are thrown to hell ma salakakum fi saqar what made you being here they say لم نكن من المصلين. We're not among those who were praying. In dunya we didn't pray. Like because I didn't do my salat al-sobh, so I ended up being in hell. Why didn't you do the salat al-sobh? Why did you miss your namaz? Quran narrates the story for us so that you and I take heed and learn from them. وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين. Because we didn't believe in life after death. We didn't believe in the day of judgment. So if I don't believe in the day of judgment, meaning rewards and punishment, I'm going to be reluctant when it comes to my salat. If I'm reluctant about my salat, I'm going to end up being in hell. This is about wajib. But what about mustahab? God is not going to punish you and I if we don't do nafile so. God is not going to punish you and I if we miss our namaz shab. That's why we are reluctant about it. Otherwise, if there was an obligation, you would make sure you meet it. It is for this reason that if you have a that, uh, like intersection here in, in Nairobi, that there is no traffic light, yet there is a police officer standing there and says, Sir, please kindly give room, make room for others. Do you think that people would, uh, would take heed and accept it? There is no penalty, there is no penalty, there is no fine, nothing at all. Just kindly, please uh, drive gently and kindly. People, they don't care less. That's why unless there is hell, there is heaven. There is punishment and there is uh, reward. Otherwise, people do not take heed. Quran says that, look, all the punishment of the hell that I warned you about and still this is what you are. Imagine if I, I tell you, and Imam Khomeini, rahmatullah, he says, and I heard this from his, his own lips. Nobody narrated this to me. In his late 70s, he said, I testify that in all my life, I have not been able to offer two rakat namaz for the sake of God. <laughs> when you say, Salat al-Maghrib, Isha, anything, Qurbatan illallah or Lillah, he said, Lillah is very difficult to say Lillah. That's why our fuqa say, to say Lillah, yani for the sake of God. Do you know why he, what he means? He means that let's imagine hypothetically speaking, God announces tomorrow that I have removed hell and heaven. No matter how much you pray, there is no heaven for you. No matter how much you have missed of your, of your prayers, there is no punishment. For the sake of God, if you truly love me, come and pray. For the sake of God, for the sake of God, if you truly love me, fast. Don't expect any rewards. Then you will see who will get up to pray. Okay. So, life after death, hell and heaven are so essential for building us, preparing us for that. Again, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. almost five more minutes and I want to take you to one of the most important benefits of fasting, uh, of uh, belief in life after this before I give you an assignment because by the way the series of talks this year is a little bit different from uh, last year I'm going to give you some assignments and you have to do assignments inshallah but the last point for tonight one of the so important benefits of belief in life after death brothers and sisters is the following the days of our life are either happy days or sad days if you are too much rejoicing like things are going so well make sure you spend some time to go to Qabristan go to the cemetery if you are so grieved 
and you want to lessen your grief, alleviate it or like uh, kill it all together, again make a trip to Qabristan as well. Going to the cemetery, remembering of death and your, your death is a regulator. It regulates, like it keeps the balance inside you and that's what we need. That's what we need. Why? Because no matter how miserable you may think you are, financially, family-wise, health-wise, you name it. No matter how miserable you may think you are, rest assured, if you are a true believer in life after death, I need to go to the footnote or somehow between brackets here. The very first day of my life in the Islamic seminary of Rome, the very first lesson that my teacher taught me, do you want me to share it with you? Allahu Akbar, what a brilliant hadith. Please, please, pretty please, memorize this hadith. Not only memorize it, keep it handy with you. It's a master key. Rahmatullah, just for the uh, pleasure of uh, your marhumin and especially my teacher who taught me this in the first day, please say salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. See, more than 30 years, I've never forgotten this, and inshallah, we'll never forget it. And how many people in consultation I have been able to console them with this hadith? You will see. It's quoted from the Prophet وسلم, to have said, أَوَّلُ الْعِلْمِ مَعْرِفَةُ الْجَبَّارِ وَآخِرُ الْعِلْمِ تَفِيضُ الْأَمْرِ إِلَيْهِ The first level of knowing God is that God that I know and I believe, He is Jabbar. And then my teacher was explained that Jabbar here, it means he compensates you much. He compensates you much. No matter what kind of injury you go through in your life, no matter what kind of turmoils befall and calamities befall on you, the bigger, the more compensation. At the end of the day, the, the span of the life of dunya is so limited. Even if you're in your entire life of dunya, you're miserable. It's not going to be more than 80 years, 90 years. How much do you think you're going to live? But think of eternity in the hereafter. And the Rawayat says, Ayah of the Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for any, any tiny injury, so trivial that it's nothing yet, God will compensate you. Will compensate you until, وَلَسَوْفَ يَوْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى God will say, is this not only about the Prophet, God will give you, will give you, will compensate you. God says, because I'm a just God. I could compensate you in dunya, and often I give you a taste of the pleasure in dunya with a little bit of compensation. But dunya is so limited. Dunya doesn't have the capacity for my generosity to demonstrate it to you. I have reserved you for your akhara, for your eternity. So much I give it to you that those like terminated ill people, those who all their life they were on a wheelchair, those who were I don't, having problems, miserable in their life, in the year after I said, I wish never my prayers were granted. I wish if I knew that I would never pray for, for recovery or anything. See how much. And God says, my slave, are you pleased now? And they say, uh, the prophet says, they say God is beyond my imagination. Beyond my imagination. This is the last lesson. We have to leave that for the last lesson. But at least let us learn the first lesson of Islam. Rest assured that any hardship you go through in your life, the Almighty God will compensate you until you are fully satisfied, beyond satisfaction. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Assignment for tomorrow, inshallah, okay? Assignment for tomorrow is, please, if you want to come to this series of talks speaking about uh, death and beyond, with all respect, you are not expected to be just an audience and sit here and watch me and wonder. You are needed tonight to die respectfully and come back tomorrow with your will. Not that come back to me, but do this please. If you want to get the benefit of it, let us practice it. 
in Surah Al-Baqarah, few ayat before, uh, ayat talking about fasting. That means before you start your fasting, you should have already sealed your, your final will, your wasiyyat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us about wasiyya, final will, regardless of your age. Don't think that you have, unless you get to your 80s, it's too early. Israel is not going to send you a notice of vacancy, comes unannounced. And I'm sure you all have seen when you go to the cemetery, how many, inshallah, one day will make it there as well. Let's see if possible to go next Sunday. We can all rearrange with Hajj Riyaz. On one weekend we go there. One of the lessons, inshallah, we may conduct it there. You'll be too scared and I'm not sure if the cemetery is open. Otherwise, I wish you could do it at night. And I'm not going to scare you, but it is true. In one place in Sydney, when I was some years ago running similar course, and then I took a group of the youth to the cemetery, and one of the boys lied down in the grave. There were some ready graves that there's no uh, dead body in it. Just ready so that when someone dies, the grave is ready. I wanted to teach them talqeen. He said, Sheikh, I'll go, then. I'll go down there. He went, lied down, and I was doing the talqeen on him. This guy didn't last long, unfortunately. Two years later, uh, two uh, no, two years less. Two months later, he had a heart attack. In another place closer to you, similar subject I was talking about, about talking about the wasiyya, and I'm serious. Okay, I will tell you. It is in Mombasa, at the corner. I was talking about the wasiyya on another occasion. I brought the wasiyya, and I went through the wheel, explaining to them how they write their wasiyya. The day that I said, tomorrow I'm going to talk about wasiyya, one of the rivers sitting there, he said, Sheikh, I really need to know about the wheel because my relatives are not Muslims, and if I die, God knows what will happen to me, they, whether they cremate me or, or what, whether I'll be buried in a Muslim cemetery or not. I said, make sure you come tomorrow, because tomorrow I'm going to go through the details of the wheel. Guess what happened? That young brother, early in the morning, he comes out to go to the masjid, and he was hit by a car, died instantly. Okay? Inshallah, third is not lucky. I, I don't pray that it happens here, Ya Rab, Inshallah, may God protect you and prolong your life. But I'm mentioning these truths, this is called inevitable. So I deliberately mention these examples to you so that you rest assured as young as, who is the youngest one here? no matter how young or old you are. When we go to the cemetery, you may have a section for babies, stillborn even, okay? Please, tonight, assume when you go to bed, assume that your bed is your grave when you are lying down in bed. It's so constructive. It works much better than the rest of my lectures or anyone, come give your uh, lecture. And then write your will. Write it in, in this way, Allahu Akbar, I, 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 I'll, please, uh, if I have your uh, attention, please help me with salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A brilliant hadith, a gift for tonight, a brilliant hadith from Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam to instruct us how to write our will. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, A'idda jahazak wa qaddim zadak. وكن وصي نفسك ولا تقول لغيرك يبعث إليك بما يصلحك. Quick translation. Imam says in the old days he's using a parable. In the old days when they wanted to go on a trip, even today, the group leader either himself or has agents in Mecca, for example, ahead of you or in Karbala ahead of you. There is a chef cooking, making food ready for you, accommodation ready. Imam says that a'idda jahaz, like pack your bags. A mu'min, his bag should be always packed ready for the hereafter. No pending file, especially if you have any debt or anything, unless it is, if, if it is managed, it's under control. Pack your bag that always, if Israel comes now, I'm ready to go. Yalla, ready to go. Send forth your provision. Send forth, send it ahead. Write your will. When you are writing your will, if I get a chance, if necessary, I will explain it to you, inshallah, without causing any, uh, any, any damage or, or, or death uh, here. 
When you are writing your will, you are expected to appoint one or two executors of will. Those who are going to execute your will. Okay? A mom says, write the executor I will. I hereby appoint Mansour al as the executor of my will. What do you mean appoint? A mom says, yes, appoint yourself. And then say, okay, Mansour al now you died, Rahmatullah alaik. What do you want me to do? Do it yourself. ولا تقول غيرك يبعث إليك بما يصلحك. If I have ten years of salat, for example, ten years of fasting, I haven't been to Hajj. There is a homes to you on me. I owe someone. Why do you write it in your will and you never do it yourself? No, no, don't touch my wealth until I die. Make sure that there is absolutely this certificate that there is no chance for me to come back to my office and not generously give all of it out. Allahu Akbar. What's the virtue in that? Imam says that you didn't care about yourself to send your provision forth for your akhirah. Why should your heirs care? Allahu Akbar. In my age, in my career, I have been around these dying people a lot. In, in the burial of so many people. Believe me, I have seen children of the deceased person over his grave fighting over the inheritance. Do something for yourself before it's too late. Don't wait for your heirs to do it. They may not. They may not. So Imam Sadiq says, write your will and appoint yourself as the executor of your will and start implementing it, executing your will. Well, I had 20 years of uh, like lapse prayers. Start doing it. Rewayat says that like five years you did and then you died. God is not holding you responsible for the rest of it. Because God says, had he lived, he would have done the rest as well. No need to worry about the rest. I had that much homes never paid. Start paying it off. Even in between, before you finalize it, you die. No problem anymore. This is a true way and real way and the Islamic way of writing the will. Not that write everything and leave it for the heirs. This will may never be executed. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <clears throat> Sunday belongs to Amirul Mu'mineen and Fatima to Zahra. Inshallah, because in Layal al Ghad we want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in honor of Amirul Mu'mineen, please be conscious of your needs and ask Fatima to Zahra for her shafa'a, inshallah. And uh, I will read this part of Dua Tawassul, inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad Ya Fatimatu al-Zahra Ya bint Muhammad Ya qurrat ayn al-Rasul Ya sayyidatana wa mawlatana Inna tawajjahna wa istashfa'na Wa tawassalna biki ila Allah وَقَدَّمْنَاكِ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ حَاجَاتِنَا يَا وَجِيهَتَانْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ اشْفَئِ لَنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بِجَاهِ مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَالِ مُحَمَّدٍ وَبِحُرْمَةِ الْفَاتِحَةَ مَا السَّلَبَاتِ